Thank you very much and good afternoon all. I'm delighted to uh, see you all here, especially on such a beautiful afternoon when you could be outside enjoying the good weather and doing lots of other things. Uh, but this is, uh, this is spectacular, and I, I thank you for coming. I'm very grateful to the LA Media Reform Group for holding this uh, uh, conference. It's a group that's turned, I think, uh, itself in from a, from a group of just uh, grassroots, uh, grassroots advocates into uh, really an organized force for, for change and for good things that we need to happen in the world of our media ecosystem. So. Thanks uh, to them, thanks for the Common Cause uh, people, Kathy and Brooke and Angela and Todd who put it to, uh, together. Thanks to the Occidental Urban and Environmental Policy Institute, the LA Progressive, anybody else who had a hand in putting uh, this together, we're very, very, uh, very, very grateful for that. I know I saw some of you out of Denver at that media reform conference and I've seen others of you at, uh, uh, at other venues. So. I am really pleased that I'm here, and I'm even more pleased that you are here. Thanks. Uh, it's been, as some of you know, a, uh, a sad and heavy week uh, at Common Cause because we lost our great leader, uh, Bob Edgar, on uh, Tuesday morning. And his, his dedication to the public interest and to human rights and to uh, justice and the common good is just... Uh, uh, legendary, and he's really why I ended up at Common Cause after I left the Federal Communications Commission. I, I knew I didn't want to leave those issues behind, but I didn't know where would be a good place to pursue them, and I thought about academics or just freelancing, whatever, and Bob said, why don't you come down and join our board, and then the more we got to talking, we decided that we really needed to get Common Cause at the epicenter of media reform and media democracy. So we went out and uh, raised some money and started the Media and uh, Democracy Reform Initiative and uh, hired uh, Todd Noboyle to uh, uh, run it every day. And uh, uh, I ended up working pretty much full time on it myself. I thought I was retiring after the FCC, but it didn't really uh, didn't really uh, turn out that way. But Bob was. Uh, you know, you, some of you remember the old Reader's Digest, the most unforgettable character I've ever met. He was one of those people that would be on anybody's list, and uh, he was the personification of how uh, uh, democracy works, uh, starting out uh, uh, with almost uh, uh, nothing and becoming a, uh, a pastor in a church while he was uh, still in, in college, uh, became a chaplain, then he ran for, uh, for Congress in a heavily uh, heavily Republican district in Pennsylvania. Nobody thought he had a chance of winning. He won and was elected five more times. He was one of the Watergate uh, babies, uh, a real force for uh, all kinds of reform while he was there and uh, president of the college after he left uh, uh, Congress. He was defeated for the Senate by Arlen Specter and then uh, was president of the college in Claremont uh, out here and then uh, General Secretary of the uh, National Council on Churches, where I first met him, and then for the last six years, seven years, six years, President of Common Cause. So uh, uh, he was an amazing combination of grit and grace, uh, of determination, a gentleman at all times, but uh, he had a steely look in his eye, and you knew that uh, he was dedicated to reform and that he knew how to go about the business of making things happen. So he was part visionary, part pragmatist, part preacher, part political. Uh, philosopher and just uh, somebody, it's, it's going to be a tremendous personal loss for me and it's a loss for American uh, democracy uh, too. He was uh, a man of faith and a man of good works and uh, we'll miss him. Media, as uh, some of you here know, has long been my passion. When I went to the FCC as a commissioner back in 2001, merger mania, merger media, media merger consolidation, was already in high gear, and it didn't take me very long to figure out that a lot of my time, in fact, an inordinate amount of my time was going to be spent in just considering proposal after proposal, transaction after transaction, for a few big media companies to swallow up independent local media outlets all around the country. And it didn't take me long to understand that what we were talking about here wasn't just abstract numbers about how many outlets a particular broadcaster could uh, own, or we, we were not talking about 
the viability of one business plan against another uh, plan. This was about, or it should have been about, something that cut far deeper into the soil of our democracy, because at its root, this is really about the health of our democracy and the health of our media, about the health of a news and information infrastructure that we must have to ensure that we the people have the journalism and we have the facts and we have the media tools that we need in order to be informed citizens and intelligent voters. And we are nowhere near to having that kind of media now. And that is why the gears of our democracy so often seem stuck. So our challenge really is to reinvigorate American media, reinvigorate journalism at a point in time when we don't even know that investigative journalism is going to be able to survive. And nobody knows that better than you folks living out here. Traditional media, newspapers and radio and television and cable have incurred life-threatening injury, not just from the coming of the internet, and I don't think even primarily from the coming of the internet, because this happened before the internet really got up to anything approaching full speed. It was born from a generation of private sector hyper-speculation that too often let the quarterly dividend trump the public interest. Too much of our media, in other words, fell in love with consolidation. And the problem was worsened by 30 years of public policy apathy. I'd call it dereliction of duty or absent without leave, and it continues to this day the outright abdication of responsibility by public sector agencies to do the job of public interest oversight. Uh, and that certainly includes front and center the Federal Communications Commission, where I worked for over a decade. And as far as the new media, the internet, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but just as a general statement, so full of promise, it still falls short of its tremendous potential. And no one has to date found the model or the momentum in new media to support the kind of in-depth and resource-rich journalism that I think we have a right to expect and that really democracy depends upon. The hard truth is that for all the many blessings of new media and the internet, we have not yet gained online what we have lost in older traditional media. I'm talking about being able to tell a journalist, for example, take six months and dig into this story. Don't worry about filing nine other stories uh, today or doing a blog or doing the radio show or anything. Like that. Just go, go get this story, dig into it, find the facts and tell the truth. I'm talking about media that can support bureaus in state capitals, bureaus in Washington. You know that at last report, 26 states did not have an accredited reporter on Capitol Hill? How is that for holding the powerful accountable? And I'm talking about bureaus around the world. That's all expensive, but it's also necessary. But the facts uh, of what has happened are brutal. You know, the thousands, probably 20 or 30,000, maybe more news people have lost their jobs over the last 15 or 20 years. So we've got all these reporters who are walking the streets looking for, looking for a job rather than walking the beats, uh, running down a story. And the result of that, as more and more reporters got the ax, is glitzy in, infotainment, replacing uh, in-depth investigative reporting, opinion, supplanting facts, spin, displacing substance, and thousands of stories that have, would have held the powerful accountable going unreported, and even going unknown. That's the worst part of it. Nobody knowing what's going on. It's gotten so bad that a recent Pew Research study that was just out a couple of weeks ago showed that one-third of the respondents to that poll had abandoned previously used outlets because they weren't getting the news and information that they wanted from that late night TV, uh, TV news uh, show or whatever it was. 
too much weather, too much sports, not enough news. Undeterred, consolidation continues. You know, for many years, the big media types would come by the FCC and they'd say, oh, this, this is it, we won't be back for more. Just give us the okay for this one deal. But they always came back and as soon as they went out the door, the competitor was in saying, you let that outfit get big, so now you gotta let us consolidate too. So it just keeps going on and on and on. And I know just from being here the last couple of days, and Todd and I were out here in, in December too, the tremendous interest that you have about who's gonna own the Los Angeles Times. Uh, we know that a great city deserves great media. It requires great media. And it's hard to see how placing more media in the hands of Rupert Murdoch or turning it over to the Koch brothers or some other titan of the world of media, uh, mobiledom, I call it, uh, is going to help. To, to me, that just represents a flagrant failure to protect the public interest. You'll hear from some people, especially if they happen to be broadcaster lobbyists, telling you that, well, consolidation really, really is good. Uh, you know, it's going to bring us more and better coverage of local communities, more journalism. But you and I also know that that just didn't happen. I heard that line for more than a decade, and you've heard it here in Los Angeles before. And, and lost in the debate, probably not lost in this room, but lost in a lot of the debate in, the, in this uh, area, is the fact that the current ills of the Tribune papers are a consequence of consolidation, not a cause of consolidation. They're the result of consolidation. And I warned about this when Sam Zell and his clueless uh, colleagues took over the Tribune. Uh, didn't do much good, but I did. If that hadn't happened and if that transaction had not been green-lighted, the LA Times and its sister publications might not be up to their eyeballs in debt right now unable to cover beats that need to be uh, uh, covered. And beats that I'm sure their editors would like to cover if they had the resources to do it. Digging for stories for which they just don't have resources. And that's depressing to walk around the floors of the LA Times building, which I've done twice now in the last uh, few months. And uh, uh, you look around and you see empty desks in every direction. That's really really sad. Uh, don't get me wrong, you know, the Times still has great reporters and it still unearths uh, important stories that would not otherwise see the light of day, but it's not what it was and it's not what it should be. You know, all these arguments about consolidation kind of boil down, in my mind, to one question. If media consolidation is so good, why is media so bad? Here's another uh, facet of the story that mainstream media doesn't talk about very much. It's about how consolidated media, downsized media, homogenized media has adversely impact, really harmed diversity in this country. Diversity of content, diversity of viewpoint, diversity of, of ownership. You know, your country and mine right now is about one-third minority. Before the middle of this century, sometime in the 2040s, minorities will constitute the majority of our population. Yet racial minorities, and you may, you may find this hard to believe, but it's true, racial minorities own 2.2% of all full-power commercial television stations in the United States of America. 2.2%. Can you imagine that? And the statistics for other minorities and diversity groups and women who are actually a majority of the population, but when you look at the ownership statistics, they're all in that single digit embarrassing range. So is it, is it any wonder then that when you see minorities and diversity groups on TV that they're so often stereotyped? and caricatured, or you see so few uh, minorities on the Sunday morning talk shows or as anchors on the uh, uh, networks, is it any wonder that the issues get such 
sparse coverage. You know, I, I, I've been to probably 75 or 100 town hall meetings over the last few years, uh, and some of them go on for seven, eight, nine hours late into the night, and always representatives from the diversity uh, community. I remember in South Dakota, uh, one night, some of, the, some of the Native Americans coming up, almost in tears, saying, you know, we've got all this stuff we're trying to do, we've got all these issues we're interested in, they don't get covered. We have these positive contributions we're making to society, none of it ever gets covered. When we're on TV, it says, uh, you know, victims of uh, alcoholism or suicide or something like that. Nothing of moment to us is really covered, and that's a story across the whole wide gamut, I think, of uh, uh, of diversity in America. It makes a difference who owns a newspaper. It makes a difference who owns a broadcast outlet. What's going to get covered? The stories that are going to get told. How dig you're going to deep? How you're going to reflect that community uh, that you uh, uh, that you uh, live in? So we have a, a tremendous challenge there, and probably my saddest uh, disappointment at the Federal Communications Commission after the decade that I spent there was the, the unwillingness or the inability of the Commission to do anything to provide incentives for female and minority ownership. We have a diversity advisory committee, private sector, public interest folks who have sent up, I think something like uh, 87 different recommendations, and they all just kind of disappeared under the chairmanships of both parties. <coughs> And I suggested, I said, well, just for openers, why don't we take one of those each month when we have our monthly open public meeting and vote it up or down? They won't even do that. So that's got to change. Uh, big media is basically white, male, uh, affluent, and it's really in many ways more reminiscent of America socially in the 1950s than what America should be in the 21st century. And as I mentioned earlier, it's not uh, just the private sector with its urge to merge that is fault here. It's been uh, uh, the public sector. We just talked about the uh, publicity part of it, but it's blessing all of these merger consolidations. The FCC seldom meets a merger that it doesn't like. It all culminated in that, that outrageous uh, Comcast NBCU merger a couple of years ago, which combined new media, traditional media, content and distribution, vertical, horizontal control. It was just uh, about the worst kind of deal that you could uh, think of. The vote was four to one. You can probably guess who the one vote was uh, uh, was against it. But <laughs> It was interesting though, you know, looking back on it, neither Comcast nor the uh, majority of the commission uh, that approved that merger ever claimed that it would do anything like lowering cable rates, for example, for American consumers. And you can see why when you opened the papers a couple of months ago and you saw that all those efficiencies and economies that Comcast gained out of the uh, thing were put to the use of buying the other 49% of NBC from General Electric. Didn't go to build more broadband. It didn't go to bring journalism back to NBC uh, News. It didn't go to lowering cable rates. It went to making this huge company even bigger than it already was. Uh, in addition to that, the FCC is very culpable for having eliminated over the course of the last generation just about every semblance of public interest guideline that we used to have for broadcast licensees. We used to have things like the fairness doctrine and uh, personal attack rules and uh, something called ascertainment, which means if you own a station, are you going out and talking to members of your community about what kind of issues and what kind of programming they would like to have? We used to require that. Back when the broadcast station owner lived in the community and went to the gas station and the restaurant and the barber shop and the hairdresser and all the rest, now the owner can be two or three thousand miles away on top of some big building in New York City or Los Angeles, and we don't require that anymore. We have no licensing regime whatsoever to, uh, that has any credibility for a, for a broadcaster. 
Uh, we used to have some guidelines and said you have to come in every three years and have your license renewed. And not that we did a spectacular job of it, but at least the broadcasters knew that we could hold them to account potentially. Uh, those are all gone now. Now we say, well, come in every eight years or send us a postcard saying you'd like your license renewed every eight years. And it's called postcard renewal. And there's good. Uh, there's a good reason for it. So, so the public sector default has been every bit as grievous as the private uh, sector. With the blessing of the consolidation, the elimination of the public interest stuff, the failure to do anything about diversity.